the, the first thing I wanted to do is uh, introduce my colleague, Lev Gorenstein. Lev is new with our customer team. Um, you can see him on one of the screens there. And Lev is, as I said, with the customer team, you may be hearing from him, or if you ask questions, he may be the one to answer. We're very excited to have him on board. He comes to us from Purdue University. So he was a user, a customer, a subscriber of Globus. So um, he knows things from, from your standpoint, and that's really, really helped us. And we're, we're really happy to have him on board. So uh, welcome, Lev. Uh, just a couple of things I wanted to cover um, about uh, your subscriptions, right? You, you're, you all have subscriptions, or most of you have subscriptions, but what do you do with that, right? And Bridget is going to talk a little bit more about uh, sharing and kind of what you're going to do from a researcher standpoint, but I kind of just wanted to cover from a high level. We, when you sign up for your subscription, you you get a subscriber welcome kit or you get the link to the subscriber welcome kit. And I encourage you to go there. Um, you know, when you, when you had that ticket, when you had that support ticket for the subscription, you may have missed it. Um, you may not have seen it, but I encourage you to go there and there's a wealth of knowledge there and you can kind of poke around and, and, and see what's there. But I wanted to cover some things that I think are important and maybe obvious, maybe not. And the first is endpoints and collections, right? That's what Globus is all about. Deploy as many as you can. Make sure um, your users on your HPC systems, um, your users have access to those collections um, from their home directories. So I, I just encourage you to deploy as many endpoints and collections as possible. Again, may seem obvious, but um, maybe not. The next thing is managing your endpoint, and that's why you have a subscription. And just to kind of review the concept of what a managed endpoint is, when you create, a, create an endpoint, you're, if you have a subscription, you have a subscription manager. This is a set of identities that can manage your endpoint. What does that mean? So it doesn't mean there's any ongoing responsibility or they now own your endpoint or anything like that. All it does is it marks your endpoint as part of the subscription. And if it's part of a subscription, you can take advantage of Globus advanced features. Um, sharing, which Bridget's gonna talk about the console, which is very handy um, for managing all your endpoints. So yeah, so make, make sure you get your endpoints managed as well under your subscription. The next thing is getting the word out, right? You wanna take advantage of your endpoints by, by letting, or take advantage of your subscription by letting your, your users know you have it. And you know, you saw Greg talked about training and we're gonna work with him, we'll, work, we'll help you out, we'll work with you. We do sessions like this, we do lunch and learns, we do all sorts of different sessions. Uh, Bridget and I were actually just in, at Case Western University, we did two days of, of Globus training there, so or two half day sessions. So um, that was fun. We do a lot, of, uh, a lot of outreach like that. Next thing is don't be afraid to try new things. There's a, a, a whole litany of things that you may not know that Globus is capable of. If you look at our doc site, docs.globus.org, and I'm actually going to paste a bunch of things into the um, uh, into the uh, the chat so you can see some of these links there. Um, talking about uh, do things like the command line interface. Command line interface is really slick, especially if you're a shell scripter like me for automation. We've got an SDK, right? So we can use our API set. It's a nice Python SDK. So if you want to author to that and, and integrate Globus in your applications, you can do that. Flows, uh, we introduced that uh, about a year ago at Globus World and really kind of released it into the wild. And it is an automation platform that we have. And I'll release some, some uh, information about that. We have a, a site with videos on it. We have a YouTube channel. So I'll uh, give you the links to that, as well as a GitHub site. There's a whole bunch of stuff on there that you might want to dig into and see what Globus is all about. Uh, and the last thing is we, we love hearing from you. Um, that's my email address. If you've got questions, you can certainly send them to me and our support staff, right? We've got the best support out there. So if you have Globus type questions or when you're deploying endpoints, you're not sure about something or you have questions, um, you know, support at globus.org is always your, your first line of defense. So I'm now going to turn it over to Bridget and I'll paste some links in the chat window as well. One of the features of your subscription is that uh, you can enable data sharing. So data sharing with Globus um, can be enabled on your on your endpoint. It can also be enabled, by the way, on a personal endpoint. So if your users are installing Globus Connect Personal, for example, on their laptop or their 
Windows server in the lab, um, for example, they can also enable data sharing with Globus. Um, I think Vass gave a whole presentation on data sharing to this group a few months ago, maybe six months ago, so I won't go into too much detail, but if there are people here who've either forgotten that or would or are new, happy to go into the details of how data sharing works um, with Globus. I'm gonna walk through just a few of the common ways people use data sharing so that you can start thinking about whether they might apply to your institution or if you have these use cases that you are supporting that you could use, maybe use Globus to support. So the first is pretty obvious. It's ad hoc sharing with a collaborator. So your users have data, on on your system on your system and they have a local account they can access the data but they have a collaborator elsewhere maybe outside of the institution um that collaborator has no uh access to that data they do not have a local account um so instead of having a temporary account provisioned for that collaborator for example which often gives that collaborator probably more privileges than they really need if all they need is to access a few directories or a few files even. So instead of doing that, instead of having the collaborator ship the data over, I mean, have the user ship the data over to the collaborator and all those, or for example, move the data to a file sharing platform maybe, or um, some common location where they both happen to have access they can just share the data in place using Globus. Um, so the collaborator doesn't need a local account. Um, they can just, the, the, your user can um, add a permission to their data in order for that collaborator to use Globus and access the, whatever directory that user shared, accessed, um, the, the collaborator can access it through Globus. And I can tell you more about how that works in the in terms of details, if anyone's interested. Okay, so your users just need to share some data with someone and they don't have a local account. That is probably one of the most common use cases for sh data sharing with Globus. Another very common use case is data delivery um, by some sort of facility. It could be um, a, some kind of user facility, an instrument facility, like a, for example, a sequencing facility, a cryoam facility, an imaging facility, or a user facility like a beamline or, um, well, beamlines are pretty common, um, even, for example, telescopes, other facilities that are producing a lot of data for a lot of different people. And those people aren't aren't all at the same institution. They are um, distributed all over and those the instrument facility needs to get that data to the users. They very often will uh, create the data for the user, put it in a folder through Globus, add access permissions for that user on that folder. And then the user without any, again, any kind of account being created for them can log into Globus and access the data that's just been um, generated for them. Another common account is uh, sharing within multi-institutional projects. So if you have a, a large uh, clinical trial of some kind or a multi-institutional research consortium, for example, some kind of project where there is, again, a group of investigators all at different institutions, but they all need access to the same data, Globus sharing is an excellent way to do that. And they don't need to create, um, you know, accounts all at one organization, for example, in order to access the data. They can use their own, own institutional credentials, and yet everyone can access the same, the same data that's sitting in the same location. Um, sharing data sets through data portals. If you data sharing is often used um, for science gateways or data portals, where again many people are coming in, many researchers are coming in to find data that they'd like to um, move or download, and Globus sharing commonly can enable enable that kind of um, access. So again, there's a common theme here. If you have people. Who, from many different institutions with a variety of identities, and you don't want to move that data to some place where everyone can uh, has the same identity. Like you don't want to move it all to 
Google Drive, for example, and then everyone logs in with their Google account. You don't want to everyone move move it to S3 and then everyone has to get uh, right an IAM user, for example. You don't want to do that. You just want to share in place where the data lives right now. Well, this is a good, a good um, option. Provisioning storage for users. Now, obviously, Globus doesn't provide storage, but a lot of um, sort of computing centers are now um, provisioning storage for their users beyond just what they have on prem. They're provisioning uh, cloud storage, for example, um, to supplement what they can provide their users on prem. So they'll um, they want to provide uh, S three storage, let's say, for their users. Their users. Um, don't want to learn how to access S3. And even if they did, they also have trouble then moving the data into S3. They have trouble moving the data out of S3. And so this is for users who really just want a web interface. They don't even need to know that the storage they just received is backed by S3. The, the um, computing center just gives them a link to their collection uh, that happens to be S3, but the user doesn't need to know that. The user can open up that collection in uh, the Globus interface and move data there, uh, share it with collaborators. So they can really take advantage of um, other types of storage that they may not be familiar with without having to learn that particular storage interface. So provisioning storage for users is, is we're starting to see more uptake um, of Globus sharing uh, through this use case. And then automation of data movement and sharing. If you are automating um, any kind of Globus tasks, uh, you you want to use a a the type of collection that can be shared, and that's for technical reasons. Happy to go into that at some point. I don't know if you guys have had an a, a um, Globus technical talk yet on automation, but when you do, you'll hear us say you want to use a guest collection. For that, it, uh, it's much more um, amenable to, to automation. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about sharing and, and some of the best practices that people generally are using when, they are, when they're sharing data, some of the guardrails you can put up for your users um, when, they, when you allow them to share. I'm gonna pause before doing that and see if anybody has questions about the, these use cases or have other use cases. And if they're wondering if sharing might might be applied. At Purdue, we've seen a lot of people using global sharing as a way of just making their data available to the world as part of public yes. post publication um, requirements. Yes. Or yes. Many it doesn't have agencies. to be through. That's right. It doesn't have to be through a particular data portal or repository necessarily. Right. That's a good point, Lev. Yes, yeah, so or public data sharing as well. Uh, hi, Bridget. Uh, just before you move on, sorry, I'm Ali from CSIRO. Um, I'm interested in the use case you mentioned about provisioning storage for users. Um, I mean, I'm in CSIRO's cloud team, so we are provisioning S3 storage and configuring it to work with Globus for the users, which isn't 100% straightforward, but we've managed to automate that for our users. One of the things we're struggling with a little bit, though, is we'd like to automate that last bit of um, configuring the Globus connection. Um, and I was wondering, you know, what people do around that. Maybe it's a question for later in the Prezo. Um, you know, do you guys have any plans for a Terraform provider or what configuration management exists uh, to help us manage those collections? So so um, I'd have to know more about how you're provisioning that store. So are you creating um, a new Globus Connect server endpoint for each of those buckets or a, it's one endpoint with many collections on it, is it for? Yeah, currently it's one endpoint um, uh -huh. with okay. um, many con con collections on oh, it. Collections. But we're actually yeah. open to like we're not sure if we're doing it the right way. We're open no, to that's the best. That. That's yeah. <laughs> you don't yeah. Um, I think that that's really the way to go. You don't want to create another endpoint. We do have tools for automating deployment of endpoints. We have. Um, some Docker container images, things like that. Um, but that's really for, for automating yeah, it's more the configuration the of the pointer. Yeah. So the configuration of the mapped collection. So we do, you can, um, well, we have our command line interface that you can use for um, scripting um, 
creation of those collections. We have our um, SDK, Python SDK, where you could use an application. You could create an application a client in, in Globus to then con configure each collection that you're creating. Mm -hmm. um, any other ideas, Greg, Lev? Yeah. SD, Python SDK or the CLI. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. for um what there are a couple of ways you can you could do this. It sounds like what you're doing is you're creating, are you fam familiar with a mapped collect the difference between a mapped and a guest collection? Uh a little bit. I'm not actually in the team that manages Globus, um, but I am mm -hmm. familiar okay. with enough to okay. yep, to follow. <laughs> yeah. So um the way that uh, folks have been using sharing in particular for provisioning cloud storage is they will actually, what they will do is set up the guest collection for, you know, and they, they may script it. Actually, they would, they're, they're using um, Globus Automate, which is a um, task orchestration. They, they set up a flow that will create that. Um, they're working on setting up a flow to create that, that collection. And then they assign this user that they want to share that with as the what's called the access manager. So the user can't actually change anything about that collection. They can't change any of the configuration about that collection. They can't change the name of it or anything like that. But what they can do besides use it themselves, they can share it out with other people. So there mm -hmm. are roles like that that don't allow the user to um, have any rights on the collection that sell on the configuration of the collection, but they can read and write whatever, you know, to, to the collection and then they can in turn share those privileges out to their collaborators or the lab or, or whoever they want to share okay, that storage with. Yeah. Cool. So um, contact us if you want more uh, like details on that. Yep. Um, go ahead. I think Greg has his um, email. On, on the on the slides that we can leave with you and just email him and he can he can forward it to you. Awesome. Uh, uh, more one details. one more question, if I may. Sure. Um, oh, please. I'm to say, um, how other organisations are managing their um, their S three credentials in Globus? We find our customers are not thrilled um, with the process of adding those credentials into yeah. Globus. You know, we and we're yeah. fairly strict at CSIRO. We require. Um, you know, CIS recommendations are that that access keys get rotated every 90 days and we enforce that. So every 90 days, they have to generate new creds in AWS, which we've actually automated some of that, but then they have to, you know, log into Globus, change their keys. Yep. Um, so we've looked at a few ways so to rotate it, but we're not loving them. <laughs> okay, so a couple things about that. First, I just, you may know this, but just to remind you that, um, and this has nothing to do with the rotation or anything, but some people say, we don't like the idea of Globus having our users' keys. And I just want to tell, we don't have their keys. So the keys are stored locally. Globus doesn't access those. They, we, they are uh, stored locally, encrypted. We don't have the encryption key. So we have zero access to those keys. It may feel like you're entering it into the Globus web browser, which you are it's on the, the end web browser point. is not sending them to, to our <laughs> service. It is sending yeah. them to your local. So just want to be clear about that. <laughs> and we have had other other institutions say the same thing that you have. And so you can configure your, I think this is a configuration on your collection or your storage gateway. I cannot remember, but, but it's a, and again, I can send that right. So that the credentials are user managed. If the user, you can create credentials for the user and you can enter the credentials um, into the Globus web app, or actually you could script this as well, generate the credentials for them. You can do the rotation. They don't need to, they, they don't need to deal with those credentials themselves. So you can manage okay. those credentials if you like, and then you would do the rotation yourself rather than asking yeah, so the automation's controlled. By you us. would you could rotate the key. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank Just you. Rotate that was... the secret to the key. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. Okay. Sure. Just send a send an email, and I'll point you to the documentation um, that describes describes that. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. May I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my name's Warren Kaplan. I'm the science lead for genomics and biomedical data at NCI. Um, here in Australia, and um, 
when I look at your current slide with regards common use cases for data sharing with Globus, uh, and specifically the first item regarding ad hoc sharing with a collaborator, uh, from my perspective, as I look at this list, I think to a large extent that I have a, that there's a disconnect in terms of my understanding of the full capabilities of a Globus and what it is that we're doing. So for example, we're wanting to share data right now with an external collaborator. I would see the ad hoc example that you, or, or uh, line item that you've given there is really appropriate for us. But the way in which we're going about it right now is having a dedicated um, so-called NCI project with a specific um, Globus collection that would be assigned to it and that would go out to others. So. My real question is, how is it that one becomes um, sufficiently au fait? What, what I guess I'm really looking for is some sort of a globus evangelist with that, that I can engage with in terms of these are the use cases that I have. And my use cases are quite diverse from ingestion to sharing to numerous other cases. Would it be appropriate or OK for us to be able to reach out to Globus in order to be able to describe our situation and, and to be able to get advice on how it is. Absolutely. We do that all the time. Happy to have a webinar with you, your team, you sit down, you can describe the use cases and we can talk about whether Globus is appropriate or not for that particular use case. Happy to do that. I and mean, that's fantastic. What, what Greg and Lev are here for as well yeah. as I'm ha also happy to do that. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's usually very, can be very successful because I will say that it can be difficult to imagine, it's not, but it can be difficult to translate uh, Globus and what we say it can do and how it does it to your particular concrete use cases. That yep. is a very common hurdle which is why we do this very often. So happy to do that. And to anyone else here, that, that offer stands. Thank you very much. I am going to talk just a little bit about best practices um, or I think of them as guardrails that you can set up for your users. Um, now, some people, I, I will say there is an entire spectrum of Globus users to, we are not going to enable sharing for anyone, period, end of story, to, um, we are so happy that that our users can share with whoever they like, whatever they like, because we do not want to be involved in that. We are so tired of setting up setting up accounts for them that's their data they have at it. Um, so that's the entire spectrum. We see people easily um, on both sides and everything in between. So I'm just going to talk about um, some some guardrails you can put up and you can decide where you are on that spectrum if you decide to enable data sharing um, on your collections, which by the way, is not enabled by default. So, so by default, your users will not be able to share using Globus. Um, all right. So some things to consider when you're going to enable sharing for your users. The first is, uh, are you going to uh, apply any restrictions on sharing permission levels? So will your users only be able to share um, read permissions with their collaborator or also read write um, permissions? There are some institutions that only allow their, their users to share uh, with read permissions. So they're happy for their collaborators to read the files all they like. There's no other um, constraint that they put on, but they do not want collaborators writing to their file system. Um, you can also think about, well, is it going to be read only for some paths? And are there other read write other paths where, for example, their home directory, you you can they can share a read write if they want a collaborator to maybe push data um, to your system. So think about think about that. Um, any restrictions on which users may share? So can everyone share data? Anyone share data? or anyone maybe using the open storage system, but maybe the secure data enclave you've deployed, you don't want any users of that enclave to be able to share data, for example. So you can define which users may share data and which users may not. We have some 
uh, some systems who require users to go through some training um, if they're sharing using Globus to share um, data with protected health information. The user has to go through some training, sign off that they've gone through the training, and then they may share and they use Globus to control then who, who can share and who can't, who's done the training and who hasn't, for example. Um, any restrictions on paths that may be shared? So you can control which paths may be shared, which may not be shared. So um, the user may have um, access to um, write their home directory and anything underneath it, the scratch space, other areas of the file system, but maybe you only want them to share data from their home directory, anything in their home directory. Um, maybe they don't need to share scratch space, uh, or maybe there is project space, and you know that is project space for a multi-institutional um, collaboration, so that is the only area of the file system that, that, that you will enable for sharing. So you can control what parts of the file system are shared. Um, let's see, any user-specific sharing policies? Right, so there are, you can, you can go down to the level of this user may share this path or vice versa, this user may not share this path, these users may share these paths, not that path. So you can get very, very specific about what can be shared and who can share it and at what level. And then lastly, you, can, you cannot control who they share, with whom they share on an identity per identity level. What you can do is control which identity providers are being used for sharing. So for example, if you only want to share with, you, you don't want your users to share with anyone with a Gmail address, let's say, with a Gmail identity, um, or maybe you only want them to share with the institutions that you know are in this multi-institutional collaboration, you can say, okay, they can only share with people at, at this set in, within this um, organization, the set of organizations. Um, so those are some of the way you can really open sharing up to a single person and a single directory to uh, any kind of sharing at all. Um, when you do allow sharing, there are a couple ways you can monitor and manage that sharing. So as an administrator, you can view all of the identities people have shared with. You can delete any of those um, sharing permissions. You can delete the guest collection. So a guest collection is the collection that the user creates in order to share, share out their data. You can delete those. You can also manage those guest collections and delete them according to the time they were last accessed or last created. So you can, you know, if, if there are guest collections that haven't been used in six months, you can you can get rid of those. Um, we're also working on um, the ability to set a maximum time that a sharing permission is valid. So if you are worried about um, users sharing their data and then never removing that permission when it's no longer needed, you can actually set some maximum value. Like you can only have a permission uh, for a month, let's say you can share with this collaborator for a month. And if you need to reshare, go ahead and reshare as many times as you like, but every month you're gonna need to refresh it, for example. That is not released yet, but we are working on it and it's not too far away. And then for your users, if you introduce sharing a couple things that you should perhaps um, emphasize. And so where possible, and this isn't always possible and doesn't always fit the use cases, but in general, you want to create one guest collection and then share it many times. And what I mean by that is a user creates a, a guest collection, um, which is kind of the doorway for their collaborators to come in and view the data. And then all the user needs to do is share uh, the folders under that collection with whoever they want. They do not need to create a guest collection every time they share with someone. We see that all the time. And that just is very cumbersome and gets hard to manage for them. Um, they can use groups to manage the people they, they share with. So they can create a group of their lab members, for example, and share you know, various folders that they want all lab members to have access to. And then that way, all they need to do is manage that group. So when lab members come and go, all they're doing is adding and removing people to that 
group rather than going back to those folders and adding re and removing people to each of the folders that they need to access or where access needs to be revoked. Um, I mentioned that you can control the sharing permissions, but let's say you allow read write sharing. It's a good idea for the user that it to remind them that if they don't have to share write permissions, then don't. If, if the collaborator just needs to read the data, then just that is the default sharing permission. Write is not default. Read only is the default. And just, just leave the default as is. Um, share with institutional identities. That's a generally be better practice than sharing, let's say, with a Gmail account or even your GitHub account. So try not to share with personal accounts. Um, and remove the sharing permissions when they're no longer needed. I already touched on that. So that's all I have in terms of sort of best practices for data sharing. Um, happy to talk more, happy to talk a little bit more about how sharing works behind the scenes in Globus. Um, so I'll open it up for questions. Okay, while we're waiting from Paul, does, does anyone else have anything for, for Bridget or the team? Paul, Paul actually posted it in the chat, and I'm oh. certainly happy to read it if we want to do that. Bridget, you want me to just read it? Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, so he says, he has the question, we need, to dis we, we need to distribute data to many different clients' collaborators, but for the clients to be able to download the data via Globus with a batch download and authentication, it seems necessary for them to set up a Globus endpoint. However, we are concerned that some of our clients will have problems with creating an endpoint, firewall rules, et cetera. Do you have any recommendations to work around this? Yeah, so my recommendation is, so first of all, you're right. Um, if you want to move or share large amounts of data, HTTPS download is not the way to go. Um, you want to have a managed file transfer. Um, so you don't, the users do not need to install a Globus Connect server endpoint. They can install Globus Connect personal, which um, plays with firewall rules uh, much, much better and is much far simpler to install. So we always recommend then that they install Globus Connect personal. I don't know if that answers your question or whether you've already considered Globus Connect personal. And to add to that, installing Globus Connect Personal does not require any admin privileges. It's completely user land, and there are clients for, uh, I mean, there are versions for That's right. Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. So whatever they have, I can put it in my home directory and make my home directory a bona fide uh, Globus endpoint. And now I can talk to the rest of the Globus world and download or, or even upload from my little personal endpoint. Yeah. And Globus Connect server requires inbound firewall connections, Globus Connect personal only outbound connections. So much easier to configure. And, and usually the firewall is already set up for that. And personal is a very common thing to do on, on uh, instruments. instruments. Yeah. Right, because of the windows, a lot of instruments um, first write the data to Windows servers. Yeah. Terrific, Jason. Good to hear. Yeah, up. hi, um, Bridget. Thanks. This is uh, great. Just following on from the person from CSIRO's question, and in the context of data sharing and authentication on identity. Do you have a recommendation for best practice on what I assume is one of three scenarios and how you can set up Globus? So you can either set up Globus so it's um, a local identity to the actual uh, server. You could set it up to have an institutional identity or potentially you could set it up into an AF identity if if Greg wants to, to buy into um, whether that's something that Arnett are um, providing some help with. But I guess my question is, are you better off setting it up into something where everyone has a one identity type model and then managing data sharing through your permissions? Or do you start from the other direction and, and only scale things up? Can, can you talk to that a little bit if that's if that's possible, please? Sure, I need a little bit. I, so I'm not I'll, entirely I'll clear on the model. So yeah. I'll give you a little An context. Example. I work for a, a research data generation facility and we're going to look at using Globus 
for a whole variety of things that you laid out in your first slide. You know, we're going to make data available to uh, end users. We're going to use it to move things into the cloud. We're going to use it to move things into archiving and, and so on and so forth. And I'm trying to understand when we configure it, do we configure it with literally just the identities where we create an account every time we want someone to get access to a data set? And so it's all locally managed. Do we tie it into our institutions, uh, um, you know, Microsoft-driven authentication? So basically everyone in the university has an account, and then we manage data sharing on the basis that we have permissions and, and so on and so forth. Or is there a way to tie it into the wider community through uh, Arnet and AAF where everyone in Australia has an account in terms of authentication, but um, that way we don't have to add people or create accounts or whatever. We're just enabling things on a permission basis. Does that make, does that give you some context to understand the question? Yeah, it does give me some context. I think so. So let me back up and say that for, for data sharing. So, so there are two types of access that's enabled, that is enabled by Globus. One is through a mapped collection. And in that regard, in that mode, you need to map the Globus identity to the local account. Um, and so that then it's important to choose which identity provider um, the, those Globus identities are gonna be in. So are you going to um, say any, so what, what's the domain, for example, at your institution? Anybody at your institution? Sorry, oh yeah, sorry. No, so I'm um, I'm within the Cryo EM facility within the Molecular Horizons Research Institute, which is the University of Wollongong. Okay, so all Wollongong identities, um, Globus identities, you would consider when you consider how they map to your local accounts, and then you can control the mapping. So that is that is a mapped collection model, and if you are just serving, if if the Data transfer is just going to be done by Wollongong staff. For example, if your facility is doing backups, there's no, you, you don't really generally need, depending on the use case, you don't, you probably won't need to use data sharing because you're just going to log in. You have a local account. The local account is going to do the backup. You don't need to do data sharing. So that's one. But if you are sharing out to multiple people with multiple different identities, it actually, you can use any of their Globus identities. So that's the nice thing about data sharing is you don't configure necessarily which identities or which identity set someone has to be a part of. You can share out with any identity that that is not, you can constrict it if you like, um, but generally people don't. And you would just share with anyone who's coming to use the facility and, um, has you know need to access data at your facility regardless as long as they have an identity I should say that's recognized by Globus and there are these two thousand or so institutions that are recognized by Globus. So does that answer? I, I sense that doesn't answer your question. No, 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 no. It answers a lot of my question, but I was wanting okay. to just listen to the next question and then respond. So okay. If Jared, I've been asked to speak, I'll, I'll volunteer something. Um, so Bridget, um, that's great. You can, somebody who's allowed to share can share with anybody who has got a Globus identity, a Globus account. Um, is that just working for everybody? Uh, how do you find and validate the, the people that you want to share with? Or um, is it just sort of clear that as an institution that's you know some sort of data provider, they come to you and you just ask them, give us a Globus ID, and then you use that. Obviously, we don't do we don't do the sharing. You do the share, right? The data, yeah. So the data owner, a collaborator would come to them, or a facility user, or whoever would come to them and say, um, "I need access to this data," or the facility knows that that person needs access, and then they would then go into the Globus interface. Um, find that person if they've already logged in or if they haven't logged in, they would just type that person's email into the Globus interface and then that sharing permission would be created um, in the Globus transfer service. So, um, so knowing, that knowing, knowing that the institution that somebody is coming from and what their Globus identity will be if they use their institution's normal way of signing up to Globus is a valuable thing. Yeah. Um, yes. 
Yes. So you, if you have their email, you do need to know something about them. You need to know at the very least their email. Um, or even better, if you know that they have an identity that's recognized by Globus, you would just, which gen, which frequently is the same string as their email, but um, you you would ask them, okay, well, what's your wall and gone identity, for example, just send, send me your, your identity. And then either you'll, you'll, you can search and if they've logged in before, you'll actually find them as a user in Globus, or if they've never logged in, you can just add, add their email. Globus has a pretty good service for searching for identities. So if you put I in could, an email address, if you're sharing it out, yeah, you could. You want to I demo could demonstrate. It? I could. I could demonstrate sharing right now and share with. So uh, I'll let's uh, deal with Steph's question. So uh, Steph's question is: We have quite a few users who would like to automate their movement from a personal endpoint to their server endpoint for automation reasons. They'd like a guest collection of the GCSN to avoid reauthentication token expiration. Um, good, you know, like we talked about, uh, guest collections for automation. Um, however, we don't allow writable guest collections on our server endpoint. Is it possible to allow users to have write access to their own guest collection, but have them not be able to share that write access with anyone else? So a couple of things, um, I'll, I'll provide the first part of the answer, and I may be off here, but um, perhaps you want to use mass, mapped collections. Do they have an account local on that server endpoint. If they've got an account, you might want to use a mapped endpoint so that they can, they're effectively transferring between their Globus Connect server and their home directory structure. Um, if that's not the case, yeah, you can set up guest collections for them and you can even tighten that down. So there's one guest collection, but maybe a series of directories for different users. And you can control who has access to what and if they could be able to write into that directory, but certainly not share it with others. Okay, so we've got a working POSIX-based um, collection where we've got some commercial customers using it. Now the use case has come up to map about a thousand um, user accounts where all the users are in our internal Microsoft um, Active Directory structure. And to because there's over a thousand users, we've created a home directory structure using um, a tiebreaker of A to Z and then putting everyone under that. So my account, um, Sid Young, TRI like to start everything with a T, so it would be TS Young. So it would be slash home slash S slash TS Young. Um, is it possible to map that um, and have people authenticate in AD with a collection? So I've got read write access to my home directory only. I'm assuming it is, but I haven't been able to find an example of how to do an actual mapping in the collection when I create the collection. So there's there's two questions there is can Correct. you authenticate with 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 Azure yep. um or with with ADFS or Azure AD and um yeah it, it the ability is there but we need to do what we call an and uh, uh alternate identity provider integration so we can integrate Azure identity providers as in the Globus off but that requires um some work and it requires there's a fee for that but it is possible. Okay, so the the Azure demos that are there, they're not complete then. So there's one or two demos um, that show an Azure integration. They've gone into Azure and they've picked up a token and so forth and mapped it. So that doesn't actually work. So where did you see so, this demo? Uh, that just should work. Google search. I can't remember exactly, but I could find it. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think they could use an OIDC server, right? Uh, that does right. ring a bell. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's right. Yeah. It, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. You're saying use the OIDC server locally to the endpoint. Yes, you can do that. Okay, so the OIDC server would talk to AD through what an LDAP exactly. um, interface. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Exactly. okay, all right. Okay, okay so, so, yeah, so I, I, yeah. I okay, thought you so wanted to get that in your identity provider in the globes off, misunderstood. Yeah, no, the yeah, um, so, so they, your they, users they, would have to, yeah, yeah, they'd have their own Globus authentication, whether it's the institution yeah. or, a, or a globusid.org um, authentication token, whatever. Um, no, it's just when they hit our endpoint, um, yes. it would have to be AD. Okay, so that that should work out of the box, yes. And and if you yeah. don't have, yeah, that should that should work. Globus also, uh, Globus Connect server comes with an OIDC server, yes, yes, I'm using um, it for the project authentication now that seems to work quite well actually okay okay 
So okay, if so you have any questions, more questions, setting that up again, support at globus.org, but that sh it should, this should work for you. Should work. Out okay. Of so the second, the second part of the question was the, uh, the tiebreaker using A to Z as a tiebreaker. Can you specify through the CLI? Um, I know it has like a percent username when you create a collection. So you can map to that to say slash home slash percent username for the POSIX oh, one. That. Is there a way to pull apart the first character as a tiebreaker in that string when you define the collection. So I could, I'll put it in chat, what, what the format would look like would be something like slash home slash capital S slash TS young. Have you, have you explored doing that with a map with um, identity I've looked, mapping? I've looked through the documentation to see if if you can pull the username characters apart and I couldn't see anything straightforward, like a straightforward example that says, here's the magic formula, apply this. In yeah. Order. Yeah. So Lev, maybe you can answer, or you can, if I'm on the right track here, if you've, I don't know if you've done a lot of user mapping yet, but um, you I can, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I haven't done them directly, but I, I've seen them done. So uh, the easy, Basically, there is a mapping. Once you are identified, there is a mapping uh, of um, whatever the identity to local path. And you can make it as simple or as complex as you want. And you can even have a script you know, like that, uh, running that, that would get the incoming parameter, a uh, globus identity, and output the path. Uh, it could be a, a simple a simple transcript uh, change or re regular expression based change or substitution or even an auxiliary script. Uh, and I think that that identity mapping guide has lots of examples of, yeah, of those. It and I've tested it does have a lot of it, examples, yeah, but not this specific. And, and if you one. don't, yeah, so you should right. really send your specific example to support. Okay. I, I don't mean to be. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, off, that's, no, that's but, fine. I've, I've had plenty of interfacing they, with support. They've been really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, they yeah, are really they are good. They are experts and, at that. Yeah. Exactly. And and they'll they'll be able to answer. Just get, just write out your yeah. example and they'll be able to give you the, yep. the magic yeah. formula if there is one. Yeah. Okay. But it all sounds doable. It from, should be. It should be doable. Yeah, I thought yeah so. it should be. I think, okay. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sid. Yep, sounds like the Globus support desk is is maybe the first port of call there, and um, we we know they've seen quite a few <laughs> emails um, from from this end uh, coming through there lately, and they're they're really responsive and great. Um, we've probably just got a few minutes over time, so uh, does anyone else have any other burning questions before we uh, start to wind up? Let's see, as we wind up, while you guys are thinking about questions, I can share some data with you. So um, for example, I, let's see, I have some, I have a collection here, one of my, this is a mapped collection that I can access. Um, let me see, let me find one that I know this identity that I just logged in with um, can access. Actually, I logged in with an identity that doesn't have a lot of I'm going to log in. I'm going to log in as University of Chicago, and the University of Chicago has some storage for me. And I'm going to open up um, a mapped collection. Here's some data. I'm going to share some FASTQ files. Um, and the way that I'm going to do that is um, hit share. And I'm gonna add a guest collection. This is that one time step that I said, users will need to do this only once and then they can share out their data with whoever they like. Um, and all they need to do really is give a display name so that when their collaborators come in and, and look for their data, um, they know what to look for. So um, Bridget shared data, Robson, and I'm going to create the collection. And now I'm going to actually do the sharing. So this is where I would find someone. I, I can either share with a user. I could share with a group of users, like I, I mentioned previously, if I, have a, if I have a group that I'm managing. 
um, I could share with anyone, all users, or even make it public, but I'm going to share with a particular user. And all I need to do is search for that user. I will share with Lev, for example, or um, you know, I'll share with Lev, or I could share with any of you who've logged in. Um, here is Lev, let's see which he's got, Lev at Purdue. It sends a notification to the person I've just shared with. I can, I can, and I can add some personal message. Um, here is where I can share read or write, and then I would just add the permission, and I'm done. Uh, or if I can't find this person, I can just share with their um, email address. There is nobody, Jason at State Edu. That is fine. I can add them to the whoops to the collection. Ugh, sorry. Anyway, uh, that was my typo. And then send an email to them, and not to Lev. Um, right there, their email address. In this case, it's the same as the user, and I add the permission. So that's all there's to it. I, I hope that it, that illustrates a little bit more about how your users would, would share, or, or, or if you are managing a guest collection, how you would share. Bridget? Mm -hmm. uh, Bridget, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's mm -hmm. the difference, between, sorry, you had, I was looking at that, you had uh, users, all users, if you wanted to share all users from Globus and then public, is that, mm -hmm. I'm reading that, what's the difference between that? Because I see that as the same, like, is that saying anyone who's logged into Globus has access to your share or? If you if you select all users, that yeah. means the users would have to authenticate to Globus in order to access the share. Okay. If you and choose public, yeah. public is truly anonymous. You do not need to authenticate uh, to Globus okay. in order to access the share. Now, if you're accessing the share through the web app, you need to log into the web app anyway. So yeah. in that case, but if you want to anonymously access that share through the API, for example, you do not need to make an authenticated call to the API in order to, to access the collection. Okay. And some, this is actually a requirement for some data sharing that it is that it is anonymous data sharing. So um, it's there is a slight difference there, but for some people um, it's an important difference. Um, yeah, look, thanks, Greg, Bridget and Lev. That's been fantastic. Um, Clearly, too, the Globus office hours is a bit of a hit because the nature of the questions we get um, aren't always easy things to, to resolve via email. So just the opportunity to have to come together and discuss those kind of things, which leads me conveniently into um, I'm really interested to hear from everyone how you know, these sessions might work for you. So as we look to next year, um, the frequency and format of these sessions, um, there's still a lot of questions. Obviously, I think uh, we heard from Sid's example that once an institution's established one endpoint, then all of a sudden that opens up, you know, more possibilities for, for deploying. So we're kind of moving from getting the initial endpoint up and running now to, to growing um, the, the service, but also looking at how um, researchers can, um, institutions can facilitate what or how their researchers share and who they share with. So uh, my idea is that it is that we're working towards growing that ecosystem of connected airpoints, uh, endpoints, not airpoints, sorry, across the sector. Um, so you know, what, what do we need to be able to do that? Um, something that's coming up in conversations around discovery of uh, endpoints at other institutions, maybe having a um, a list of uh, Australian institutions that are uh, using Globus. Uh, and there's also as it touched on too whether there's interest in us providing brown bag sessions and and training of that nature to to researchers to help build that awareness and and support that uptake. So um, we'll probably send out the slides and have recorded the session. Uh, so I'll um, send out these questions as well because very much um, interested in sort of making sure these uh, sessions are, are suiting your needs and quite happy to tweak them in any way um, based on you know what this community needs. So if we don't have any more questions, again, I'd like to thank Greg, Bridget and Lev for, uh, I was going to say staying up late, but it's probably not quite their time, but it's definitely out of, uh, you know, 
normal business hours. Happy and, to be uh, here. Yeah, thank you. That's been great. That was great, Bridget. Um, and, you know, as I said, looking ahead to next year, how we run these sessions. But again, too, if there's any specific, we, we, we tended to get down into specific details um, just now. Uh, any follow-ups and that, we're, we're happy to help or to facilitate that discussion. I think the Globus Service Desk um, for some of those more technical uh, issues is, is the great port of call because they're very responsive, very helpful. All right, so if there's nothing else, thanks everyone for your time today.